one thing I think that has not changed, I, women sports broadcasters are still held to a different standard than the men. If we make a mistake, we don't know what we're talking about. If they make a mistake, they just made a mistake. Welcome back to the show. We have another great guest today. We have the amazing Danielle Sargent Musselman. She's a former sports anchor and television personality with over 13 years working at networks like ESPN, Fox Sports, and the NFL Network. Danielle started her career uh, really pushing past the mold of a female sports anchor in a male-dominated industry. And not only did Danielle do that, accomplish that, she also has built an amazing social media following as part of the work that she's done. She is married to Eric Musselman, who is the head basketball coach at the Razorbacks at the University of Art Arkansas. And after leaving broadcasting, she turned her attention on philanthropy and her family and has really been focusing on how to use social media to build awareness for a lot of the causes she cares about. And what we talk about today is what life is like as an influencer, a creator, and how it has benefited her and how her sports broadcasting background came into play in terms of what she now does day to day. I really enjoyed my conversation with Danielle. I think you will too. So we're going to jump into it. Here we go. Danielle Musselman, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Excited to be here. We have worked with you on a number of different campaigns for clients and I am so inspired by your background, and I want to talk about how you got into the space that you're in now, but let's start with your career in sports broadcasting. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I, I think I realized that I wanted to be a sports broadcaster maybe my junior year at Florida State, but looking back, like that was always what I was talented in, but I didn't really put it all together until that point. And I was always an athlete, grew up in a family that watched sports on TV, went to sporting events. And like I said, I just all put it together. And I said, this is what I want to do. And it's funny because I even remember at that point that I wanted to do national sports. And like ESPN was always the dream and the and a goal of mine. And it was amazing when I actually achieved that. But that's how I got involved in the broadcasting business. You start in a really small market and that's what I did. I was in Macon, Georgia, and I worked my way up and had the opportunity to work at most of the major networks. So really grateful and thankful to have been able to have a career that was something I was so passionate about. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about your background then. You said you were always an athlete. What did you play? Let's see. What didn't I play? I, by the time I was in high school, I settled on basketball and softball and I ran track. It's funny because I have a daughter now that does none of those things. <laughs> but um, yeah, I definitely... As, as far back as I can remember, I just love sports. Still do. Yeah. So three sports you did. You said it was basketball, track, yes. and, softball. and then and softball. Yes. So that's a lot. And what surprised you the most about broadcasting as you were in working your way through and working your way up? What surprised you the most? The, the thing that stands out to me is whenever I made the leap from local television to national television, because when I worked in Macon, Georgia, and then I worked in Kansas City, and you covered all of these sports, and it was so easy to know every single thing about every athlete, every coach, and you really didn't even have to try. It was just kind of part of your life. And then whenever I made the move up to ESPN, I realized there were so many things that not only that I didn't know of, I just didn't even watch. I never had been a hockey fan. Just There's just other sports. And so the out-of-office work that was required to work at that national level was just so much more than I ever imagined. And yeah, see, so an adjustment. You, yeah, you had to be knowledgeable about so many different sports because yes. because you could be reporting on a on number any. of different types of sports yes yes wow so, okay so non-sports person like gymnastics is the one sport I can get into 
I cannot even imagine how you kept all that stuff straight in your mind. So now you got married. Mm -hmm. Your husband is the head coach for the basketball team, the Razorbacks um, basketball team. Yes. Talk about the... So first, I'm just curious, because you played basketball, was that just a good connection in terms of how you all connected to begin with? Yeah, for sure. It was definitely something that we both had in common, just loving sports. And it's funny because we both are huge sports fans and not just of basketball. And a lot of what we do here in Northwest Arkansas involves the Razorbacks. And so we love going to softball games. We love going to football games. We love doing just like all of the things. And that's just something that we really have in common. Whenever I met him, he was not working. He had um, been fired from the Sacramento Kings and was just really taking some time. Mm -hmm. And we've been married going on 14 years. So whenever I look back at like the trajectory of our marriage, sometimes I was working, sometimes we were both working. And now he's working the, you know, 60 hours a week. And so the fact that we still love each other and can make it work is amazing because we've been through just unbelievable changes. Yeah. Well, I've had the opportunity to talk with Erin Andrews in the past in terms of her experience as a sideline reporter and some of the other things that she's that she's done in her career. And she's talked about it can be difficult for a woman in the male-dominated field of broadcasting, and in particular for sports broadcasting, how was that experience for you? And do you have advice for women who are thinking of going down that path and how to manage through it? Yeah, and it's really interesting. Erin, I believe, is right around the same age as me. And just Mm -hmm. seeing how the field of sports broadcasting for women has changed from whenever I first started until now is so much different. Whenever I first started, there were very few women that were really doing it. I remember looking up to Robin Roberts. She was, her and Pam Oliver were like the only two black women that I saw that were sports anchors or reporters at the national level. And whenever I started then, it was really like they wanted to make us just like the guys. They wanted us to dress like them and then... As the years went on, then we were allowed to embrace, hey, we are actually women. And so mm-hmm. it went toward that. But then there was a line where now we want you to be sexy and you had, but it's just, and so it was like finding my space through all of that. It's definitely different. One thing I think that has not changed, I, women sports broadcasters are still held to a different standard than the men. If we make a mistake, we don't know what we're talking about. If they make a mistake. They just made a mistake. And I honestly, I don't know if that's ever going to change. It just is what it is. But um, I definitely think so many more doors have been open. It's so much more common. People are used to seeing women on TV talking about sports. We'll still got those comments of they don't know what they're talking about. So. Yeah. And, and, and you could be in the industry. And I have to tell you, you are not the first woman who's told me this about being in a male-dominated industry, that even if you have more experience, more credentials than a guy, you're questioned, your credibility is questioned, and the guy's is not. And it sounds like maybe that is a theme within these male-dominated industries. That oh, that is. is. I, I just had lunch with someone that is an executive And she said to me, as a woman, they don't take you seriously until you're 35. And then when you're over 40, you're considered old. (laughs) That's so she has five years. Yeah. I said, she said, I feel like we have this sweet spot of five years. And I don't think men ever walking around saying, yeah, we have a sweet spot of five years in our career. Yeah. Wow. And And I actually would love to get your perspective. I've had a few other women in the past on the show who are television anchors. They've been on and television and in a market for a while. And they've talked a little bit about how you do seem to age out at a certain point, but that seems to be changing a bit. That in years past, there was a lot more focus on, okay, you get to a certain age and maybe that number was 40 and, and you're kind of seen as somebody who needs to move along. Is that something that you see within sports broadcasting? Yeah, I definitely have seen it because you look at some of the people that were, I almost want to say pioneers, like Linda Cohn, 
And she's still doing an amazing job and still on TV. So you do see these people that started out a while ago and didn't get pushed out the door. But then I do see some other women that were so popular and the biggest thing when they were 35 and now 10 years later, they don't have jobs. So I think I think there's a little bit of both. Personally, I walked away right when I was at my <laughs> sweet spot. Once I had my daughter, Vasha, I think I was 35 or 36 whenever I got out of the business. So I was still pretty young. And so I personally didn't go through that. But whenever people ask me now if I would want to get back in, now my daughter's going into eighth grade. And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know if I'm too old. <laughs> so right. I really feel that. And that's what I want to get on to next, because I want to talk about your transition to being basically a social media influencer. Is Was that by design or did it just happen? Tell us a little bit about that. I like laugh and I still hesitate to even call myself an influencer because it completely happened organically with our move here to Arkansas and just the popularity of the University of Arkansas, the success of my husband's basketball team. And I don't know what it is. People just really like to watch our family. And I don't know if it's, I don't know. I think part of it, honestly, is because we're different. I mean, we're an interracial family. We are a blended family. I have two stepsons. We have our young daughter together. Just so many things. And I think also we're really open people about our life, but just transparent through the good and through the bad. And we really can laugh at ourselves, definitely laugh at each other, laugh at our kids, all of those things. I just think it drew people to our family. And through that, I started getting a lot of followers. My husband started getting a lot of followers. Mm-hmm. He is really involved in social media. It helps sell out our arena, mm-hmm. which we think helped win <laughs> games. So it just all went together. So eventually, companies started reaching out to me as far as working in the influencer space. And yeah, you know, it was like starting a new job all over again and learning my way through that. But it's definitely something that's a lot of fun and that I enjoy. Yeah. And you seem to have a knack or an innate ability to understand what you're all about and then what what the brand is looking to do, but bring it across in a way that is authentic to you. Do you think a lot about that or is it a natural thing for you? I decide I know that I want to be authentic and that is like first and foremost on the list. And so a lot of brands and different companies that come to me are people that I, uh, products that I already use. Mm -hmm. And so that's really easy. And I think I've always like looking back, I always was the person that was like, oh, there's this great sale here, or this really works well, or this is a recipe that I like, or I like that product. I've always been a person that shared that. Now I just get the opportunity to get paid for it. (laughs) Yes. Which is wonderful. And I want to talk a little bit about the business of influence, because I understand, as you've mentioned, that you didn't really set out to say, I'm going to be an influencer. You just started sharing authentically your life, what was going on, and people were drawn to that. And I do want to understand from your perspective, how do you think about influencing? Because people follow you, they respect you, they want to see your journey. They are influenced by what you do and what you say. So how do you think about that and the responsibility of that? The most important thing, I mean, everyone has like weeks where they maybe want to be off of the map and I have to avoid doing that. And so I, that's one thing that I have to think about is consciously posting. And that's not 90% of the time that has nothing to do with paid content. It's just about sharing my life. And a lot of times... Um, I'll look at the beginning of the week and I'll say, what are we doing this week? What would be good content that people want to hear about? Or what do people want to see out, out of what I'm doing this week? And so that is just a different way of thinking that I certainly never worried about before. I think the average person is just like, oh, dress up. I look cute today. Let's take a picture. So I just consciously think a little bit more about what I'm posting and what I'm talking about. And I just keep saying the word authenticity. And I just I just want to be my true self. And that's what yeah. happened to me. And it's interesting because I think that many people who are not in this industry, but let's be honest, so many people, everyday people follow social media influencers 
who they've come across in social media because almost everyone's kind of engaging somehow in social media. So I think the average person doesn't really understand the work and not just the work, but the the amount of time and, and energy that people who create content and nurture their audience, how much goes into it. Can you share a little bit with people so they understand what goes into it? I literally, I have a calendar and a notebook just because of times, dates, deadlines. It's not, it, it is a job. It really is something that you have to keep organized and you have to do in a timely basis and an effective basis. And especially for me here in Arkansas, I have some things that I have to travel to Little Rock for. So, you know, fitting those into the schedule, that's two and a half hours away from me. That's not an easy feat. So one thing people do need to understand is that you know, it is a job. You do have to be organized and give yourself reminders and do all of that stuff. And there are some days, gosh, it was a week or two ago where I literally for eight hours, I dropped my daughter off at camp or something. And for eight hours, I was working on things. And it was like, cause just because I had several different campaigns going on. It, so mm-hmm. it was like, new mm-hmm. content for this post this, then go do this. But I knew that I had I literally had eight hours worth of work that I had to get done by a certain date. Yeah. Well, and I think that's the other part that people need to understand when you are being hired by a company to create content uh, for them within your feed, there's work to understand what they're looking for. There could be back and forth with, hey, can you edit this? Can you do that? It's, so it's not just about, hey, let me take a quick picture of myself doing this and you get paid a bunch of money and that's right. the end of it. And then you also have to, the other part, and you, I think you said earlier that the majority of your content is not sponsored content. It's right. just your life, what goes on. Even that, like people need to understand that you are, as an influencer, as a creator, you have to engage with your audience and it could happen all at all hours of the day. Right. You put up any guardrails for yourself. Have you had to think about, okay, this is when I'm going to engage. This is not. Can you talk a little bit about that? We're definitely a household where the, the phone shut down at nine o'clock and that okay. goes for everything. And even uh-huh. my daughter, we don't let her sleep with her phone in her room. And she said, mom, like when I get in high school, am I going to get to sleep with my phone in my room? And I said, no, you're never going to get to sleep with your phone in your room because you need that time to disengage. We're already so connected to our phones and our laptops and different devices throughout the entire day. You don't need to be woken up at night by a notification. So that is, that's something that's really important. But I do, and like in the morning, it's my only time really with my daughter. So I make a point, I don't post during our, our morning when I'm making breakfast. I really focus in on that time to spend with her and to be engaged in our morning. And so anything I begin my day, if I'm doing anything online after that, after I drop her off, after my husband gets out the door, unless I absolutely have to. And then a few hours later, then you need to check and make sure that you're engaging with your audience and all of that. But I don't ever want to be that person that's at lunch constantly just sitting Mm -hmm. on my phone and not engaged in real life. Yeah. Do you think that there is a benefit as a creator, as somebody who has built an audience that follows you and interested in what is going on in your life, do you think that there is a benefit to have not maybe grown up with social media like your daughter is? Yeah, absolutely. It, the funny thing that what I forget sometimes is that her friends follow me. Mm-hmm. And she'll, so I'm very conscious. I don't post a ton about her. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. if I do, I always get her permission. Yeah. And if it's something funny or whatever, I'll say, are you okay with me posting this? Because I just don't think about it. And then she'll say, you know, oh, mom, this person commented on what you posted or sometimes her Mm -hmm. friends will be DMing me from school or something like that. So I do try to really be aware. That's something that I never had to deal with growing up. And I look at my daughter, who's so beautiful at 13, and I'm like, I did not look like that. (laughs) Maybe if I did, I would have wanted to be on social media. (laughs) And I want to talk a little bit about that both as a female content creator and a mom of um, a 13-year-old who is starting to become aware of social media if she's not already on it, her friends are on it. 
Do you think that as women, we get different types of comments, especially as a public personality? Do you get different types of comments that maybe a male creator or male influencer wouldn't get? And I've been talking with a lot of female creators about this. Right. A little bit of a trend that they they are surprised sometimes by the types of comments that they get. And they think that maybe the male influencers don't get those comments. That's possible. I am a, in a little bit more of a different category, I think, than other influencers because the reason why I have so many followers is truly just because of my husband's job. Yeah. So I, when I compare his his social media to my social media, he's a coach. He gets people like going off on him on social media, like on a daily basis. Oh, interesting. Yes. And so... If we're going through the stretch where like our team has lost a couple, I won't even get on for mental health. Like I'm very aware of, yeah. of that and how that makes me feel. And I will stay away from it if I need to. But so in comparing mine to his, he gets a lot of negative. He gets tons of positive, but he any coach or, or athlete or player, they get tons of negative stuff. And so I certainly don't get that. And I definitely don't. I'll get some creepy comments here and there or direct mm-hmm. message, but mm-hmm. the majority of my followers are Arkansas fans and they know my husband. So yeah. it's almost like a respect thing. So yes. I certainly don't get a lot of that kind of stuff. And mm-hmm. I've really learned that Twitter, which I'm not super active on, is way more negative than mm-hmm. Instagram mm-hmm. for whatever reason. Mm-hmm. And Mm -hmm. I'm not on TikTok, so I don't know how that goes. But Instagram, I think for the most part, is pretty positive, at least in my experience. Yeah, no, that's a really, that's really interesting. I had not thought about the fact that at any sporting event, people always, all the fans always have an opinion, right? (laughs) And I agree with you on Twitter. It's really interesting to watch any type of sports game while you're also on Twitter (laughs) watching the comments. Oh, it's unbelievable. Yeah. So thinking then about how social media has helped with some of the things you are involved with, some philanthropic organizations, well, how do, has social media helped with those things that, that you're passionate about? Oh my, it's been incredible. It's honestly been the biggest blessing that I would have not even imagined. One of the things that I started here in Arkansas is the Suits and Sneakers Gala, which is an American Cancer Society mm-hmm. event. Mm-hmm. And we were able to raise in the first year just a little bit over $300,000. We're now going into year three, and it's going to be an $800,000 plus event. And that's, it's unheard of. Even like all of the representatives from the other states are like, how are you doing this? But what happened with that event is the majority of the seats were taken by people that sponsored the event. And so there were very few tickets, a 500 person event. We maybe sold 50 individual tickets out of that whole thing. People then saw all of the amazing pictures. It's a really fun event, but they saw all of the action, all of the pictures on social media, on my social media, on my husband's social media, so much so that the week after the event, we had people calling saying, how can I get in? How can I sponsor? And here we are. The event's not till October. We've been sold out for over a month. Uh, So it's just truly through the power of social media, it's allowed this event to explode. It's been incredible. And so there's a couple of other things that I'm, I work on and just promoting and talking about them. If we have tables to sell, I'm like, let me do a post. Let me just talk about this event and boom, we'll get a couple of tables sold. It's just more exposure for the nonprofit that I'm working with, more people asking questions because I have found that so many people want to get involved and they don't, they just don't know where, they don't know how, they don't know what they want to do. And I think me just constantly bringing all of these options and opportunities, it makes it easy for people. I love that. And I think it goes back to the question we were talking about earlier, which is this responsibility, someone who does have this power to, to help raise money. I mean, using your audience and your following for good and get, and this is such a great sort of example in action of you being able to do that. If you think about where you want to take your social media, where is it, are you going to continue on doing what you're doing? What are your thoughts on what you're going to do? Yeah, Yeah, that's honestly, I just want to continue what I'm doing and take it day by day. And 
you just never know what's around the corner. I mean, being an influencer was never on the radar. Being involved so heavily with philanthropy was never on my radar. And so if there's anything that I've learned in life, it's that you never know what's around the corner. And yeah. just we'll see is all I can. Yeah. I'm enjoying what I'm doing. And so that's the main thing. I, I only want to do what I enjoy. And so I'm, I'm having a great time so far. Yeah, I'm just going to put this out there. I think it would be awesome if you decided you wanted to be back on our television screen. <laughs> I think that would be amazing. And we've definitely seen that too. People who we've worked with who started on social media became influencers and they had a great presence on camera. They ended up parlaying that into being on, to on camera work. You already have that experience. <laughs> And now you've got the social media following. Yeah, so. you never know. You never know. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm putting it out there. You didn't say it. <laughs> All right. Well, Danielle, thank you so much. If people want to follow you, what is the best way for them to do that? Instagram is where I'm most active. It's at Danielle.Musselman, and that's Danielle with a Y. I'm, I'm on there all the time. I'm on Twitter at Danielle Sargent. Not as active on there, but weekly. I, I pop in every here and there. So, yeah, please give me a follow. Thank you. I appreciate your time today. Thanks so much for having me. This has been fun. Thank you for listening. If you're an influencer or a brand that wants to work with us, please feel free to email us at info at Until next time.